Hello everybody and welcome to Simply Science. I'm Ari Goldberg. On this month's episode, we're going to learn just how allergies affect the body. And we're going to visit the Jones Beach Nature Center. Also, we're going to see how people are learning to build their own air sensors. But first, with more and more extreme weather events seemingly every year, there are a lot of ideas out there about how we can protect ourselves from climate change. One of those ideas is actually expand the island of Manhattan itself, which isn't as implausible as that sounds. Eddie Bailey has that story. Water is splashing over the seawalls at the tip of lower Manhattan. This all got started because of Hurricane Sandy. I saw the devastation, I saw the, the flooding of lower Manhattan, and it really got me thinking and really got me concerned about the future of New York City. Jason Barr, an urban economist and author at Rutgers University, has stirred up quite the controversy with his new proposal to combat climate change in New York. He calls this proposal New Manahata. One of the proposals I had was for the expansion of Lower Manhattan, some 1,760 acres into New York Harbor. This scene is something of a radical plan, but I don't think so. Barr says by pushing Lower Manhattan inland, it will now be protected through an undertaking called land reclamation, the process of creating new land out of existing bodies of water by filling the water with sand, rock, or cement. New York City has done land reclamation for centuries. Lower Manhattan, south of City Hall today, is roughly 40 to 50 percent larger than it was when the Dutch first arrived. The Dutch were building an empire. So their reasons for land reclamation were to add more commercial real estate to expand their new settlement, then called New Amsterdam. But Barr's reasons are ecological, with some economical incentives. More importantly, you're creating new land that could then create close to 200,000 new housing units, which can help contribute to uh, the housing affordability problem. The reason my proposal works is because the, the value of the land that you create is so valuable that it's much greater than the cost of actually creating it. So what is the projected price tag for construction? You're talking about you know, at least 30 to you know, maybe 30 billion, 40 billion, 50 billion. And how long are we talking? Probably be at least 25 years, but you could probably build the land in 10 or 15 years. Manahata is the Lenape Indian word for Manhattan. According to Barr, naming his project New Manahata pays tribute to the indigenous peoples that were here before European settlers. Not everyone is excited, and for good reason. There's the potential to disrupt uh, the natural habitats that are there. So I believe those could be mitigated in many respects. So if we create new wetlands, uh, that there are no wetlands in Lower Manhattan. They were all destroyed. So I'm proposing uh, that we try to create new ones. And if we can try to uh, get some native species back, native plants, native trees. If we just say, oh, we can't touch the estuary because we need to leave it pure, that also is ignoring all of the changes that we are doing or about to do. The new land will be built at a higher elevation in order to create a buffer to protect Lower Manhattan and preserve its economic base from storm surges and rising sea levels. The path forward has a lot of hurdles. Barr says that all levels of government have to align in order for such an undertaking to happen. You would have to have support from the New York City mayor, the governor of New York, and the United States president. Since the federal government has authority over all navigable waters, should the project be approved, the president would have to sign a bill passed by Congress. Our neighboring state of New Jersey would have to be on board because they would have legal and environmental concerns. There would also be environmental and feasibility reviews from various governmental agencies and a myriad of lawsuits that would need to be fought and won. Lastly, and most important, leaders would have to work hard to convince the public that such a project is not only in the public interest, but is also economically rational and would minimize disruption and economic and environmental harm. I think that climate change, housing affordability, transportation, uh, and jobs, employment, uh, employment locations, all of these things are interlinked. And if New York doesn't really start to prepare, 
uh, for the long-term consequences of sea level rise, of, of greater storm surges, um, you know, the impacts are going to be are going to be huge. When asked if New Manahata would be the sixth borough, <laughs> but no, it would just be Manhattan. It would just be part of Manhattan. So then it would be a community district. <laughs> this is Eddie Bailey for Simply Science. These days, people are particularly aware of how the environment affects our health. And responding to that, CUNY is helping people build their own air sensors to detect dangers in the air around them. Donna Hanover has that story. People have learned that one way to fight for clean air is data, gathering info about what's actually in the air we breathe. And the Community Sensor Lab at the City University of New York Advanced Science Research Center is helping. We're really teaching people how they can build their own sensors, how they can collect their own data, and that anybody can do that, even if you're not a scientist or don't have a background in engineering or environmental science. The website shows the Community Sensor Lab was founded by Professor Ricardo Toledo Crow and STEM Education and Outreach Manager Kendra Kruger. They started in 2019 helping high school students build low-cost, low-power sensors to measure CO2, the greenhouse gas that causes most global warming. But then the pandemic struck. They would get measurements of the CO2 levels inside the public spaces, uh, the local grocery, the pizzeria, the dry cleaners, the subway, representing different amounts of ventilation available. And this was correlated to the potential exposure to COVID. So in some instances, we even notified the, the management of these stores that maybe they could improve their uh, ventilation to keep uh, people safe. The lab now helps people from around the city build sensors that check many aspects of air quality. This is the, the main format of the systems that we have. So here what you have is the microcontroller or computer with a little Wi-Fi radio and a display. So the display shows us what's going on. And down here you have the sensors. That's the CO2 sensor, that's the temperature pressure relative humidity sensor, and that green one is the particulate matter sensor. And we have a battery, a little power supply. The sensors that people learn to build here have a do-it-yourself plug-and-play aspect, but they're actually quite sophisticated. In real time, it will send the information to our spreadsheets. Right? If there's no Wi-Fi, then the data will be stored on a little chip that we can then remove and then download ourselves. Intern Amalia Torres, a Queens College computer science student, has been designing and managing code for the system for two years. She served not just as a writer of the code and designer, but also as teaches other people how to download, how to install all these elements of the code, how to modify certain sections, how to do some debugging. An intern from the community is Carolyn Ferguson from Brooklyn. A lot of us that live in public housing are like predisposed to a lot of respiratory infections like asthma, COPD because the areas that we live in were like once populated with factories. And now that we have all these warehouses in Red Hook, we're concerned about the amount of trucks coming in and out and the effects of the air pollution that they might bring. Those particles are so tiny that they can get into your lungs and into your bloodstream and it can also cause birth defects. That makes me feel empowered to do something about it. With parts bought online, each sensor costs about $200. Grants and crowd fundraising help with costs. So far, about 20 students have done the full training so they can train others. And it's about more than checking air quality. Students or interns or community members can learn very specific skills. Skills like soldering, like how to work with a breadboard where there is certain areas you need to know what side has a positive power, what side has the negative connection, and learning about how batteries work and how computers work. Building these sensors appeals to a lot of people, and Amalia says one request was a bit unexpected. We got contacted by the Met Museum because to preserve art, uh, there needs to be certain like conditions within the air of the enclosures and they needed to make sure that there was no leaking. And our sensors are really small, and they're also low power and low cost, 
so they reached out to us and like they wanted to know if we could install our sensors in there and then we worked with them for like about a year and then we taught them how to develop these and how they could use it for other things around the museum. So it seems there are lots of ways these sensors to measure the environment can help protect what is precious. I'm Donna Hanover for Simply Science. For some of us, we need to check the pollen count daily before even going outside. And for some of us, we need to worry about dust mites before going inside. For all of you allergy sufferers out there, here's the science behind those sneezy days. Allergies are the worst. Go outside, they say. Now enjoy watery eyes and pollen. Stay inside, they say. Now enjoy sneezing from dust mites. Go pet an adorable puppy, get your mind off it. Ha! Enjoy itching from the dander. For some unlucky among us, allergies are a minefield wherever we go. And of course, for some of the unluckiest, allergies can be a matter of life and death. But how do allergies actually work? What's going on in your body when you accidentally eat that peanut or pet that puppy? Since COVID, we've all heard about antibodies and antigens plenty. And those come into play here too. It's all about your body's immune system. In short, an allergic reaction is your immune system, in medical terms, being kind of a dummy. You see, white blood cells called lymphocytes, specifically T cells and B cells, travel throughout our body. And when they run into a foreign particle, they get its details and take that information back to the lymph nodes to alert the immune system. To use a little analogy, Think of the lymphocytes here like the police pulling over a suspicious vehicle and getting its license and registration. The policeman can take that information back to the station and alert the squad. Hey, be on the lookout for these guys. Here's their info. From here, your immune system starts pumping out antibodies just to be prepared. They're called immunoglobulins, or IgS for short. Specifically, the IgE type when it comes to allergies. And because of the info provided by the lymphocytes, these IgE antibodies are designed to target these specific foreign particles. As such, these foreign particles are called antibody generators, or antigens. And that's great when the antigen is actually threatening, like a virus. But when your immune system sends out the troops for non-threats, well, that's where some of our immune systems can be a little bit of a dummy, and we get allergies. So here's where things start to go south for allergy sufferers. Remember the antibodies we mentioned, the IgEs? Well, when these IgE cells have been informed wrongly to be on the lookout for, say, shellfish, they come packing some heat. To use our police analogy again, the IgE is the SWAT team loaded up with the big guns. These big guns are yet other white blood cells, called mast cells and basophils. Just as SWAT teams carry around these big guns, so are IgE antibodies attached to these powerful cells, which are ready to release some firepower when they next come across a terrible, scary intruder like a cute puppy's dander. The IgE binds to the allergen, and a chain reaction occurs called an allergic cascade where a host of proteins join the party as the body tries to destroy the foreign invader. And during this attack, the SWAT team firepower of those mast cells and basophils unload its arsenal. Within that arsenal is a chemical we've all heard before, histamines. Now, here's where the misery begins. Histamines dilate blood vessels, fill the area with fluid, and depending on the allergen and where in the body this is all going down, bring about the classic allergy symptoms, sneezing, coughing, wheezing, which is why we take, of course, antihistamines to combat allergies. And if the allergic reaction is strong enough across the whole body, that's when reactions risk becoming anaphylactic shock, which is why severely allergic people will carry around a shot of epinephrine, an EpiPen, a hormone which forces the blood vessels to constrict, counteracting the dilating, from things like histamine. Unfortunately, we can't really control or know for sure who is going to have these wonky immune responses. Like many things, scientists believe it's a combination of genetics and environment. 
But for most sufferers, we can get at least some relief in the pharmacy when we want to pet that puppy. how green we as a society ever get, humans are always gonna have some impact on the environment. Our own Andrew Falzone went to the Jones Beach Energy and Nature Center where they taught him how the energy we need interacts with the environment all around us. The Jones Beach Energy and Nature Center or ENC is tucked away on the west end of the man-made island. It opened in September 2020 and is a worthwhile stop for any science or nature lover. The purpose of the Jones Beach Energy and Nature Center is to raise awareness about the connection between energy systems and natural systems. One side of the ENC is entirely devoted to energy. The smart building section shows how solar panels integrate with your home circuit breaker panel and how excess solar energy can be stored in a battery like a Tesla Powerwall. You can even take a look at what might be inside your own walls and learn about better choices for the future. We talk to people about materials in their homes specifically, uh, insulation, decking, and what the more sustainable choices for them might be. The ENC also provides a preview of New York State's energy future with its wind power diorama. The state says by 2030, 50% of its energy needs will be met by renewables. One of the first offshore wind farms scheduled for completion by 2026 will be visible from Jones Beach. Equinor, the company overseeing the state's wind farms, released video simulating the view from Jones Beach with the turbines just dotting the horizon. Dr. Hafner says offshore wind typically provides more energy efficiency than onshore wind farms. Combined with the, those higher wind speeds, uh, you get a lot of power. And onshore, there are a lot of obstructions. You know, there are trees, buildings. Another part of the exhibit explores how brilliant innovation and technology is sometimes just humans playing copycat with Mother Nature. In the energy gallery, we look at biomimicry, which is the science of sort of mimicking nature or mimicking biological functions to develop new technologies that make technologies more efficient. And one of those major innovations was developed at a well-known research lab also located on Long Island. Brookhaven National Labs discovered that at the nanoscale, the eyes of a luna moth have a rod-like structure on their eyeballs, and that allows solar panels to drink in more light and thus produce more energy. And this scale model of the ENC shows the solar panels that blanket its roof. They help make it a net zero building, meaning it makes more energy than it uses. That net zero number is also possible thanks to the geothermal heating and cooling system, which visitors can see through a glass door. But we got special access to take a closer look. The ENC also has another science-based energy-saving trick up its sleeve. We have a sensor that determines the amount of CO2 in each room, um, and that is a way of measuring how many people are in a room. So when the CO2 level goes up, the ventilation system kicks in and we get fresh air from outside. Overhead in the nature gallery is a parade of life-size aquatic life that really lives right off the beach. Our touch tank is modeling our bay ecosystem, which is right in between the mainland of Long Island and our barrier beaches like Jones Beach. This touch tank is highlighting a lot of the invertebrates that live in that ecosystem, like hermit crabs, clams, and horseshoe crabs. So you never know who's going to show up here to the touch tank at the Jones Beach Nature Center. This is a horseshoe crab model in its full size, but today in the touch tank is this little baby who's only about three years old. The rest of the nature gallery is highly interactive. Little kids will love the wave tank. You can create some waves by cranking that handle. That wave energy is then absorbed by those marsh grasses, so we can see that those waves aren't hitting the shorelines. 
and that kind of highlights coastal resilience with our marsh grasses. I'm Andrew Falzone for Simply Science. It always seems harder to stay healthy when you're eating out. Dietitian Stacia Helfand has some tips about how you can stay healthy eating out at restaurants. I'm always sort of saying, let's pull back, let's limit the foods that don't have as much nutrition impact, like the pasta, like the rice. Restaurants want to give you the bread basket. They want to give you the pasta that's got five servings in it because it's inexpensive. It doesn't cost them a lot and it's delicious, but you don't need that much to meet your need. And then I say, let's to make lean protein choices and tons of produce, fruits and vegetables as much as possible, no matter where you are. Let's think creatively. If you want to have the rice, if you want to have the pasta bolognese, can we, instead of putting that whole takeout box of rice on the bottom and your curry on top, can you fill your plate with curry, your bowl with curry, and put a third of a cup of rice on top, or put your bolognese on the bottom with spinach and arugula and zucchini noodles and just a little bit of pasta on top, because you just don't need that much. When you can, be empowered to choose whole grains, starches, things like rice and quinoa and spelt and bulgur and all of those interesting grains, as well as potatoes. Those are gonna have more vitamins, more minerals. They're less processed, higher in fiber, higher in phytonutrients. And then don't add the extra. You don't need the extra fat, sugar, salt. Trust me, the restaurants have put them in there for you. That's why your food tastes so delicious. Split your entree with a friend. You eat half and they eat half. Eat just half your plate and take half to go to eat tomorrow in a doggy bag. Make an, an entree out of your appetizer. So do an appetizer size, a smaller portion size for your entree and see if you can be satisfied with that. And my final tip is to drink water. Don't waste your time drinking calories or even artificial beverages. Um, there's nothing you should drink like water but water. So drink the water. The COVID-19 pandemic has killed millions of people worldwide. And as we deal more and more with long COVID now, one of the persisting issues is people still not having their sense of taste and smell. Mike Gilliam talked with doctors who are helping patients reclaim their senses. My wife made me a special dinner for St. Joseph's Day. And uh, so I know it was the 19th and I couldn't taste the thing. It was at that moment that Joe Gustavino of Staten Island knew something was very wrong. His favorite dish, chicken scarpariello, which usually is tangy, spicy, and full of flavor, had no taste at all. Joe says his wife wasn't too happy. He says he looked into the symptoms of COVID and tested positive for the virus a few days later. Uh, it was upsetting. The problem is not isolated. It's estimated about 5% of COVID patients, or upwards of 27 million people worldwide, lost their sense of taste and smell. It usually comes back within a month or so, but not always. Joe says he could only taste tomato sauce and lemon. The smell really bothered me more because if there was a fire or something, I couldn't smell anything. I could tell that there was odors in the air, but I couldn't distinguish what they were. Joe waited for about six months before going to see a doctor about the loss of his taste and smell. He was prescribed a nasal wash with steroids, and they suggested he start smell retraining with essential oil. He got five bottles of oils. It was lemon, clove, eucalyptus, rose, and something else. So the eucalyptus, I could get the cool sensation in my nose, but no odor. A year passed without any change. That's when Joe says his doctor referred him to Dr. Alfred Illoretta, who was doing a study at Mount Sinai Hospital. COVID is a virus, just like any other upper respiratory tract infection that we've had or your normal common cold, a coronavirus. The way it affects our sense of smell is it enters usually through the nasal cavity and it attaches or attacks a target within the nasal cavity. This is the cells around the olfactory tract, uh, which kind of support and surround the nerve fibers that come from your brain into your nose and kind of sit at the top of your nose. To help, Joe says Dr. Illoretta adjusted his nasal wash. And he doubled the dosage. Up. I did it in the morning and the evening. He put me on uh, prescription grade fish oil. Joe says his doctor told him fish oil stimulates part of the brain. Now things are improving. 
definitely cinnamon. I'd say turpentine. I would say smell is back completely um, and taste is it's getting better all the time. Dr. Iloretta says one way doctors are helping patients is with the smell training. It involves smelling essential oils and linking the sense to memories to kind of rewire the brain. And it's kind of like physical therapy or rehab or working out for your sense of smell. You know, you're exercising those neurons and that those sensory perception and trying to strengthen those connections again. Kits to retrain are readily available online, but it's recommended COVID patients see their doctors for a proper diagnosis. Joe's outcome has been a positive one, but both he and his doctor have a message for anyone who has lost their taste or smell due to COVID. It's a common sign of a COVID infection, so I would get tested. Uh, in addition, this is something that the majority of patients do recover from. Um, and, you know, that's an encouraging sign. But there are also some treatments that are available. I think they should go to the doctor right away. And if they can get to see Dr. Loretta, I would do that. I'm Mike Gilliam for Simply Science. And that is our show for the day. We hope you enjoyed it and we hope you learned something. Until next month, you can be in touch with us on social media. We will see you then on Simply Science. Ba -ba